Coldplay had their yellow video, which was spoke to me in so many ways. And I got a call from the studio and they were like, you can't put yellow in. You can't just use that word. And I was like, mm, actually I can. And they were like, I was like, if I was a white director, maybe. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you for joining us today and taking some time out of your schedule to just be with us, you know, and have this conversation. So thank you so much. Uh, I just want to first introduce myself. My name is Marcus Choi. Uh, I play George Washington uh, with the yeah. Philip Company of, of Hamilton. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and uh, it's sure. one of the touring companies in America. So I've been doing that for uh, a couple of years now before the pandemic started. I'm Tycho McCarroll. I was a swing on the Philip tour originally. Um, but they just transferred me to the LA company where I will have the honor of being the first Asian bullet. So oh, I'm yeah. yeah. That's awesome. Oh my yeah. God. How exciting. That's so fun. Yeah. I mean, just being here with you guys um, uh, in, in, in this business, uh, looking like us, uh, talking mm -hmm. at this level, it's pretty, it's pretty exciting. Um, yeah. Again, just the beginning, but, but still really exciting. Totally. Yeah. And John, if you can, for the people who are tuning in with uh, the, the Hamilton fans, uh, if you can just talk about yourself and uh, in, in, give yourself an intro. Perfect. Uh, I'm John M. Chu. I'm the director of Crazy Rich Asians and In the Heights. Yeah. Um, and uh, I'm a huge Hamilton fan, of course, although I couldn't get tickets when I first uh, met Lynn and I didn't want to <laughs> tickets. I didn't want to be we'll, like, we'll ah. fix that. <laughs> I faked it for about a year that I'd seen it. And then when I did see it, I was like, I couldn't, I was like, you cannot ask him all the questions because then uh, know that you didn't see it yet. Right. All the music already, but I, I, I just love it so much. And I know how hard to uh, to perform it for you guys. I, I can't even imagine trying to learn all the ins and outs of that. So uh, congrats. <laughs> it's a lot. I think it, there's a stat that's, there's something like 26,000 words in the show. Oh my gosh. Yeah, it's it's insane. It's insane. <laughs> I was um, watching um, Lynn and Alex Lacamoire and, uh, and Bill Sherman uh, teach our cast how to do in the height stuff. And I didn't realize the intricacies of the words, where you take your breath. They, they have very specific rhythms they're supposed to hit. And I, that, yeah. that blew my mind um, yeah. how detailed actually everything needs to be. And Alex is like a savant. <laughs> You know what I mean? Like he's he's next level when it comes to timing and tone and pitch. It, it's it's he's incredible. How the word is supposed to sound? Like yes, yes. Yeah. Does he come into any? I I I I live that intensity with him. Did he come in? Does he come into when you guys are doing it? Does he come in? Oh yeah, yeah. Oversee that. That's amazing. Yeah, yeah. Kurt Crawley, the, uh, he was out. He was doing the piano for us. Um, you know, live there while we were, uh, when they would do live singing. Um, and so that I just got to meet the whole crew and, and it's, Oh, really, that's awesome. You know, the, the, that the, it's a true family. It's, it's yeah. Great. Yeah. I love Kurt too. He's, yeah. he's great. I love, yeah. he's great. Um, but I just want to take a minute to brag about you because you guys, John's being a little modest. Yes. He directed crazy rich Asians and in the Heights, but this guy's resume and his relevance in mainstream Hollywood goes back like 15, 20 years. I'm just going to list a few credits, all right? He directed uh, films like Step Up 2, Step Up 3, uh, League of Extraordinary Dancers, the LXD, Justin Bieber's concert series, the documentary series, Never Say Never, Believe, G.I. Joe Retaliation, Gems and the Holograms, Crazy Rich Asian. I mean, he has been killing it and blazing a trail for Asian American writers, directors, producers, and just creating, you know, AAPI visibility in mainstream Hollywood for years. So I just want to celebrate you and all of the great things that you've been doing and the success that you've achieved, man. Taiko and I, we come from like a commercial dance work world in LA. Okay. And I don't really dance anymore because my knees and bones just won't let me. <laughs> but Back in the day, when you started working on LXD, that's when I really started, like, when you hit my radar and when I really started following your career, because it was just so incredible to see how you kind of created this vehicle to introduce dancers who are normally in the background and kind of like the bottom of the totem pole as far as creativity goes in, like, the commercial world of entertainment and bring them to the forefront and really kind of highlight this extraordinary talent. It was like such a huge thing in the dance community. Like Tycho, did you have friends that were in it? And like, how did you feel about- Tycho, have we met before? Did we, we haven't. 
No, okay. you know, so yeah. many of the same people, but like, yeah. never yeah. Met. Um, it was cool because Step Up 2 came out right as ABDC yeah. first mm-hmm. aired. And so, which is America's Best Dance Crew for everybody who doesn't know them. Mm-hmm. And Tycho, what, what crew you are? I was on Fish and Chicks. The- yeah, girl. <laughs> Um, but it was cool because like, obviously Jabberwockies was on season one and Laura Edwards was in the movie and she was in my crew as well. So it was like overload in the best way of like this underground dance scene being just like thrown into the forefront of everyone's eyes and everyone, I felt like the whole U S was just like, what is this? This is amazing. Like, yeah. Give me more, please. I felt like I was thrown into that because I didn't know that world until getting into Step Up to the Streets. And and in a way, um, you know, Jamal, Chris Scott, Hi Hat, Dave Scott, mm-hmm. uh, Laura Edwards, they all like really introduced me to their friends, the people they work with. And I became, we were all like the same age. It was just so eye-opening. I remember being um, overwhelmed. I mean, I tap dance when I was young. I'm not a dancer dancer, but I, I respect it. And, I, and, and honestly, the, the dancers when I was growing up were the only ones who would help me on my projects. So I, I learned a lot about what they were trying to do, but it wasn't until meeting you guys and the, and, the, and the dancers in the LA world that came from all around the world, by the way, they all end up in LA if they're gonna work. And I remember even going down to San Diego and seeing those, you know, 6,000 people, mostly Asian people at these, uh, whether it was Jabberwockies um, mm. or, or, or others, that I was just like, whoa, this is happening. And it's also at that time, and Taika, you you really paved the way that I don't think Asians were seen as dancers yet. Like that right. was not a thing. And I right. saw how fast that changed that, oh, no, d- Asian people do have rhythm and right. they are dancers. And now you're expected to be a good dancer if you're Asian. To me, that was like mind blowing. And then also right. meeting the Puerto Ricans, the Dominicans, B-boys, breakers, poppers. And that what it really hit me was, oh, it's not about spinning on your head. It's not about flipping. It's not about any of those tricks. It's not about performance. It's actually about uh, this necessity to express yourself. Dancers knew they were never going to get the money and the fame that an actor gets. And yet they were still doing it and they did it Mm -hmm. and they loved it more than any other artist I've seen in my entire life. And Mm -hmm. I had to swim in it and I had to be around it because it was contagious. And I just looked up to dancers so, so much. And then I got to set and realized, oh, dancer can sometimes be a bad word to like, the crew and to like producers who are like, just get the dancers in place. Almost harder than the background people. And I'm like, right. whoa, 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 whoa. The dancers are the artists. And especially in the Step Up movies, like these are our actors. These are our people. Right. So so, right. so we have to give them rest. Their ankles are bleeding from how many times we've done this. We have oh to give God. them like, to me, that was where I realized I need to protect. I, I need to help protect because I was in a position to protect. Again, dancers, <laughs> guided me as a, what an artist should be and and they um became my best friends and 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 so i was very close from 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 then on for sure that's amazing. awesome we yeah. need more people like you yeah. to, to protect and be a voice for the dance community because it's so for cool. sure one of the best things when we did in the heights our producer came up to me and you know i've worked with him before and we did step up before and he said you know we don't have the biggest budget but I can protect a couple things. What's the most important thing for you? And I said, number of dancers, because that's the easiest thing to cut. That's the easiest thing to say we don't need, but mm-hmm. this, our, our language is movement. And I know, and I, especially because I, I knew a lot of the dancers that I knew as dancers, but didn't know them as Puerto Rican dancers, Dominican dancers that, oh, that's why right. you wear Jersey. Um, with with the flag on it oh that's why you wear put that in your pocket like I took friends that I already knew and gave even more context of things that oh there there's there's this pride to it and having just done crazy rich Asians I knew what that pride felt like for the first Mm -hmm. time so I Mm -hmm. knew that that's what we had that the more I could just get out of the way and capture that it would come through the screen Um, Mm -hmm. it really does you look at anybody when you watch in the heights you watch anybody any part of the frame and they're giving everything everything yeah. yeah and and honestly lynn i give him all the credit because when he couldn't have roles for himself he manifested this he created the roles and yep. he did the work amazing he did the work yeah i got a chance to see it Tycho, did you see the the um the screen i did it's such 
a beautiful piece. Like you did such an amazing job of capturing the essence of that area. Like I live in Washington Heights and the way that you like romanticize the community there, it was just like, I, like I'm familiar with the musical, but to see it on screen and to adapt it for the screen, it transcends on to a different level. And I just want to ask you, like, when you started working on Lin on the project, like, because of your, like, extensive background with, you know, having dance in your pieces, like, what's your approach to, like, infusing dramatic cinematography and choreography of dance? And then, like, how that aids you in, you know, aided you in, 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 the, in, in the heights? Well, in a way, I don't think of it as a form, in a way. Mm -hmm. I, I think of more inside out. Um, Anthony mm -hmm. Ramos was a huge piece of this because um, rather than fitting Anthony Ramos into a piece that I thought could, he could fit into, once mm -hmm. I met Anthony, he gave me so much truth in what mm -hmm. it felt like to grow up with struggle. So much mm -hmm. truth in what it felt like to yearn, to dream, mm -hmm. to think. And I, I related to that because I know I grew up in a Chinese family, in sure. a Chinese restaurant uh, across the other side of the country. Chef Chu. That's Chef Chu, yeah. yeah. But it connected with me so much because I knew what it felt like to sit in your room and dream and that the, your yeah. dreams were bigger than the walls around you. And that the way you dreamed was as big as a cinematic event of any movie proportion. And rather than try to make the spectacle and put people in it, I used Anthony as the North Star of how do I expand who Anthony is and tell the story and tell how it feels to be him in these, in these moments. Cause it all had to come from the source of truth. In a way I had to go back to why does a musical exist? A musical exists because um, it's not for the spectacle. Uh, maybe that's where it ended up and can get perverted. And it's like, oh, just sure. for the big dance numbers. Sure. But actually um, music comes from a place when words aren't enough. Music comes when you, you have no other source to communicate but move. You have no source to communicate, but, but melody. And those three mm -hmm. notes can communicate what a paragraph of dialogue could never communicate. Sure. And we cast it in the same way. These, every person, Anthony, Leslie, Melissa, Corey, Daphne, um, mm -hmm. Olga, they had to be multilingual, not sure. dialogue, lingual, not language, yeah. but, but language in terms of music, dance, and acting. And it couldn't mm -hmm. be a switch that turned on and off. Whatever way it was to communicate, that's what a way it was coming out. And they had to ebb sure. and flow through that. And that's how we uh, formed, I guess, um, the musical itself. And that by being as honest as we could in these moments, because mm -hmm. the songs, when you break them down, are not typical Broadway songs. They are actually really, they really exude a very personal feel to them. And, and Lynn had never performed, even though he wrote about these areas, never had them performed in the spots that he wrote them about. So to see that grow out of this um, was just a very natural feeling and credit to my cast who had to be present every day to communicate sure. uh, what it felt like through these different languages. It seemed like it was such a labor of love from like every direction, like everyone involved, just there was like a, a higher responsibility for them to just give their 100%, which was so amazing to see because that, that energy just pops off the screen. You know what I mean? And I feel like in the Heights itself, at the core of its narrative, it's all about family, either the family you choose or the family you're born into, right? Yeah. And I feel like Lynn really did a great job of staying true to that narrative with like the original Broadway company too, because man, those cameos throughout the whole movie, I was like, yo, there's that, there's that guy and there's that girl. And, you know, cause I have a bunch of friends who are in the original cast and it was just so awesome to see like, you know, incorporating all of them. So That's yeah, that was, that was really going cool. Into the, going into it, because, you know, I have a group of, you know, the person who shot it, Alice Brooks, shot my short film in, 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 in high school, or in college, oh, wow. I'm sorry. And then, and, and Chris Scott, who did the choreography, I've been working with him since Step Up 2, when he was a dancer and then decided to go become a choreographer. So I saw his, I saw him make choices that were hard choices to switch over and he did it. And I saw him grow as an artist. And so we have a very, very close relationship. You know, it's very intimidating coming into Lynn's group because you're like, he just did Hamilton. Oh my God, this is good. Alex Lagomar, oh, they were going to like pick me apart. I'm not from that world, but they are a family. They argue like oh, family, one, they yeah. work like family. Yeah. And you guys yeah. know this, it's like, they were very similar to the way I work with my mini family. And so for mm -hmm. us to come together, to have that trust immediately. Sure. And by the way, they don't, they aren't skeptical when you come in. They are open arms when you come in. And 100%. Uh, that was key to getting everyone on the same page. And it, and it set the tone. This is a thing that Lynn, I think, is his true genius, of course, his words. But really, 
Uh, and of course, his, his, his songwriting, he's a lot of genius parts of his brain. Um, he has a top-notch brain, I heard. But um, <laughs> he creates an environment of creation that is that only begs for people to give their whole being to it. Yeah. And as soon as I saw that, like, you can't deny that and you want to just keep growing that. So we, the net just kept getting bigger and bigger and bigger with our actors, with our crew, with our background, with costumes and everyone was given the power to uh, speak their language uh, clothes uh, shoes lighting yeah. and I think the philosophy that he this 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 map of how you create something that even I don't know that world I'm not from Washington Heights <clears throat> allowed this flower to bloom uh, and, and so when you look at it on the screen, you're not seeing an image that I had when I was sleeping in bed one night saying, let's go make this image. You're seeing all of us pouring into this soup sure. and, and mixing it up into this beautiful yeah. dish that has spice, that has sugar, that has all these things. So I'm talking in, in, in restaurant terms. Um, right. I think that's the, that's the true brilliance of the community that he builds. Um, and I think that will be remembered. Uh, forever and will and will last forever especially of all the people who experience that now want to bring it to their own thing and and it's a very powerful tool i just saw that you're in pre-production for for wicked the movie the movie musical version adaptation and that also is this is this is a side note but that is also special to me too because i was in the original company of that and so i cannot wait to see it oh cool i cannot wait to see it yeah <clears throat> that um, is so crazy by the way uh, one, spending time with Lynn, but then also spending time now with Steven Schwartz and Winnie Holzman mm -hmm. and Mark Platt, of course. It's like, yeah. how do you take such a huge hit, of course, and, and translate to a movie, which is a different medium, which requires mm -hmm. different things, but yeah. yet keeps it, keeps the spirit in there. And we live in right. a different time than when it was written. And so right. Right. we're finding all the ins and outs of that, but we're, it's really fun to get in there and get yeah. into the complicated nature of friendship of female friendships of politics of all these things um, there, going through now there's so many underlying political themes and just relationship and um I, yeah i can't i can't wait to see what you guys do with that in it's a way it's almost so prophetic of what happens in our yeah. world that it, it's almost too on the nose that we're sort of right. like slicing in a little bit trying to like maneuver um, and it's so relevant today with discrimination and racism and classism, you know, and there's so many themes that it's really going to land and make a splash and, and you know, it's, well, I can't wait. I hope I so it. too. We'll, we'll yeah. find out. A next question that I have is, um, can you just talk about your experience uh, as, as a person of color, a POC director in mainstream Hollywood and like how your experiences earlier in your career juxtaposed to your experience working on Crazy Rich Asians? I've changed a lot since the beginning. I find a lot of joy in um, making stuff. That's why I turned to, you know, I got a video mm -hmm. camera when I was in fifth grade and, and started just shooting stuff. And, and I felt very fulfilled. Not that the final product was the thing I was going on. It was just the idea that I could make something and people could hear me and get emotionally involved without, with, with, which, without, with what I was making. It was very powerful to me. And so it's the making that really drives me. And so I think when I first got into the business, I got very lucky. I won the lottery. Steven Spielberg saw my short film. I, uh, I got uh, my first studio job. I never had to PA on a commercial or music video before. That's I amazing. Have, and, like I didn't do any other work except direct straight in yeah. with a studio movie. And um, thanks, USC. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, the problem is that you don't know who you are yet. You're just trying to like stay afloat and make something. So even though I poured my heart into step up two and step up three and never say never, I was honestly so young. I'm learning just how to like maneuver with a studio when they give you a note. I was just learning how to like keep up, like understand shots and coverage and how to work with an editor that I'm not actually editing because I had edited everything before that by myself. So right. I was learning the language of communicating, how to lead a group, how to have a vision, but not stamp the vision, how to um, just create the seeds that al allow those things to grow. So I think it took me 10 years um, to just learn. And at the same time, I always felt um, as in, Asian director, Asian American director, and, and a young Asian, I was 22, 23, I would go to a studio a lot and they would always guide me to the deliveries. So <laughs> that didn't happen once, that happened three, maybe four times. 
And maybe it's the way I dressed. Maybe it was because I had a backpack. I don't know. But but the fact is, I always felt like I wasn't supposed to be there. And right. it takes you a long time before you realize, oh, I deserve to be here. I actually do know what I'm doing and I deserve to be here. And it wasn't until then that I um, could sort of shed the chains of trying to please people and right, trying to right. please the audience and trying to please the studio and realize I need to do something that may displease them, but mm. is needs to be made. And mm. that was my role. And that's where I sort of cleared my slate. It was sort of after Now You See Me Too, working with some of the best actors in the world from Morgan Freeman to Michael Caine mm. and Jesse Eisenberg, Mark Ruffalo. I, I just felt like I had this great cast and I don't know what to do with them because we're making a sequel to a heist movie, which is great, but like, what am I here to do? And, uh, and so I, I told my agents and managers, I was like, I'm not gonna make you money for the next five years buckle up. I need to do this to find out who, what I want to say. And that's when um, I found Crazy Rich Asians as a book. And I knew that maybe I was one of the only people in the world who could get a studio to, to pay for this at the level that it needed to be paid for, because it just wasn't, it couldn't, you couldn't make that thing. But I had made enough money for people that maybe I got one I could slide in. I found in the Heights at the same time as Crazy Rich Asians. So I was in the same headspace. And I, again, reflected in, in the Heights that I could see my life. I knew who my abuela Claudia was. I knew the food that, the love language of my family that maybe spoke to me, but maybe not others that I'd love to people to communicate. And Lynn uh, had written this show that, that communicated every piece of that. So th they came at the same time. Just so happened Crazy Rich Asians came first. And luckily I thought they were going to, not wait for me, but but Lynn did wait for me. But I think in, in making Crazy Witch Asians and watching how the audience reacted to that and seeing not just intellectually what it could do, but in, in practice, mm -hmm. what happened to Aquafina um, hosting SNL, seeing right. crowds um, right. go to the theater and dress up and then stay in the lobby and just talk about it for hours. Yeah. And the debate that was happening online about, hey, did they do this right? Did they th did that wrong? Like. To me, that was all part of a conversation we were never allowed to have before. Good or bad on me, it was a great conversation to have. And so going into In the Heights, I, I knew the power that we had in our hand that we could wield for the Latinx community. And I knew the room that we needed to make in order to have those proper conversations and to, what to protect. So it was a long journey as the long answer showed, but you know, it's part of the process of becoming yeah. who you are. I heard about you choosing Yellow for the finale song and how I think Coldplay originally said no, yeah. but that you reached out to them and kind of like explained your reason of why you wanted that to be the finale song. I just really yeah. want to hear like from you yeah. that whole situation. I remember being in, in a freshman in USC when yellow came out and they had that music video and I by the way I never had MTV growing up we didn't have cable growing up so I, I, at USC I was like cable exists oh my gosh I'm watching like all the music videos there's like Britney and sync like all those things I was watching and, and Coldplay had their yellow video which was just a sunrise and it was the most beautiful expression of yellow something that I had been called in the past as as an insult and I just loved that idea of it. even though it was my own you know, me and maybe a couple of friends, our own private thing of like, when we heard that song, it spoke to us. Um, not that it was an intention ever. When we were doing Crazy Rich Asians and we had this sort of final sequence and, and it was always about an Asian American going to Asia for the first time. That was always my focus. Not about the worth of a car or the worth of the mansion. It was about her self-worth. And I loved that flip on that. And that we as Americans watching this movie had her representing America and our values in Asia. And I just thought that the audience couldn't deny and couldn't not root for her. And what she had found that she's a, a part of both worlds and that both have value. There's no bad guy in that. And that she, this sort of rise of the dragon within her is what I always thought. And I thought we have this sort of last sequence where uh, it's not about getting the guy. It's about her going home, knowing how beautiful she is and how strong she is and, and being elements of all these different worlds gave her power. Uh, we always wanted to do translations of sort of American songs that we recognize to sort of bridge the gap and, and we thought it was a fun element. And so uh, took Yellow and, and translated that and had that in there. And it just spoke to me in so many ways. And I got a call from the studio and they were like, you can't put Yellow in. It's like, what do you mean? They're like, it's too controversial. Like you can't just use that word. And I was like, mm, actually I can. And they're like, I was like, if I was a white director, maybe. Yeah. <laughs> 
I'm pretty sure I can. And that was actually a very powerful moment for me to understand. I'm talking to, you know, the head of the studio and being like, right. I hear your concern. And they're like, you know, we, there's Asian um, representatives inside our company that have concerns about it. I'm like, I hear their concerns. And he, they're like, you, you get so much, um, the whole movie, you open your arms and this last part, you could create some controversy. Are you sure you want to do that? And it was just very clear to me. I'm like, we're going to take that word back and we're going to make it beautiful. And I promise you, trust me on this. This is, this is going to work. Um, and if it doesn't, lesson learned. And, <laughs> um, and so they're like, okay, they, they give them credit. They, they trusted me on that. And then it was like, well, good luck getting the rights. And so we then had to go do that. And Coldplay, of course, said no at first. And yeah. we understood what we were trying to do with it. Um, they're very right. picky on what they're allowed, what we allowed sure. to do. So I wrote a letter. Um, as throughout my whole life, what I found is if you need something, if you're making a student film and you need a favor, show up in person, talk to the person. Humans will help you. Humans want to help. And so I wrote a letter about what that song meant to me growing up, how I needed it, when I needed it, even if it wasn't their intention, and what it would mean for this end of this part of this movie. And uh, within hours, they wrote back and gave us the okay to put it in. So uh, awesome. Awesome. So much. You touched on a pride of, of being, being able to work on that piece. And I certainly felt that, you know, just with, by myself, you know, as an Asian American, you know, the, with the visibility and the representation, it had been so long since Joy Luck Club, right? And as, as like a major motion picture that's led by a cast of Asians. And so it was so great to see you know, that finally happened and you hit right on the nail. It's just like, it's definitely that sense of pride to see that. I did it in a way almost selfishly because I, I felt like I needed to, I, I, had made a, I had made a short film in college uh, called Guaylo, which means white devil, about a kid, an Asian American kid who gets called that and, and all this stuff. And we showed it at school and it got great applause and got great things. But I always felt very self-conscious about making a movie about my own cultural identity crisis, especially at that time, sure. it wasn't talked sure. about. And suddenly sure. I felt like, oh, I became the Asian director to people. Mm -hmm. And I also didn't know if I was getting it right in terms of Hey, because I get a lot of questions like, do people really make fun of you like that? And I was like, yeah. And they're like, it doesn't feel believable in a movie. I felt like I got a lot of things wrong in how I represented it because people would tell me that. And so I didn't want to ever touch that subject again for 10 years. I literally didn't even mm. broach the subject, but it was with, with Crazy Rich Asians. I just felt like this is the thing that's been inside me this whole time. And maybe I, I have the skill sets to now express it in a way. And, it, and I had the security blanket in this book that was already popular. And, and the security blanket of like the fun and pop of a, of a rich world that we could bring the audience in. But in the end, it was always about her. It was always about her self-worth. It was always about when Eleanor says to her, you will never be enough. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's like cuts, cuts right down to yeah. me as a kid. You will yeah. never be enough. It always felt like you will never be enough. So much so that even when Constance, we couldn't do that scene more than a couple times because mm -hmm. she would just bawl. And I think... I didn't know if that line was going to play until she said it and right. we we're all bawling. Mm -hmm. And I just think that that's when you're going through life, forget the spectacle of all the stuff about crazy rich Asians. The thing that touches the people the most, the thing that why it lasts, I think is because of that idea that we all feel yeah. we will never be enough. Um, yeah. And if yeah. these movies can show that, Hey, we all feel like that and yeah. we yeah. are enough um, and you're not alone. Uh, I think that's very healing. That's very healing for us. With everything that's been happening last year and this year with all the violence and the random attacks against the Asian American Pacific um, Islander community, where would you like to see the film industry create change or advocate to help that cause? You know, how could they implement certain things into or infuse it into the movie industry? Well, I think there's very specific things and there's very big things. And I think that the specific things are look at the representation of Asian women in movies. I mean, that's straight up like there is an urgency to change that idea. Right. There is an urgency uh, because people are getting hurt because of, because of people are dying because of it. There's an urgency to say those jokes aren't funny anymore. Um, right. And it's not, oh, cancel culture, blah, blah, blah. It's like, no, this is real life. And the, this shit we've been saying for so long has effects on real people. And now it's actually happening. And so there's a complaining part of it. And then there's also like, 
we're actually shutting this shit down if you don't yeah. do it. I mean, look at the right. HFPA. Like, this does not go anymore. And if you want to survive, uh, I don't care what your opinion is. If you want to survive, you're going to need us. So get on board. And I and I think that attitude and also all these leaders that are coming out of this, mm -hmm. um, you guys being able to uh, have this conversation and people stepping up into uncomfortable zones that we didn't like to talk about before. I didn't right. like to talk about my Asianness because I just want people yeah. to see me as a director. And now I feel emboldened. I feel like yeah. I'm proud to be Asian. Hell yeah, I'm Asian. And by the way, you know, that other person on set who's Asian, who I used to think, don't mess this up, bro. Don't mess this up for me. I'm the only Asian here. Don't make it look right. be a whole thing. Right. Now I look at that person. I say, I got you. I got your back, mm -hmm. bro. Like you do your thing and I'll protect mm -hmm. you. Like to me that there's a change in a perspective. And then there's a bigger much bigger vision for this that I think is overlooked. And it happened when I saw, um, when I went to Tyler Perry's studio where he, he built this whole amazing studio. He brought a small group of people there. And he said, the reason you're here is because you're leaders and you're moving and shaking. And you went from a one to a 10 and you're at 10 and 10 is great. You're relaxed, you're chill, you have your life, you have your family, you have your house. But he's like, but I'm here to say dream bigger because the world needs bigger of what you started don't be afraid to start back at a one because right. that's how greatness begins and he's like i'm here to show you that you can dream as big as this that had a huge impact on me this was like two years a year and a half ago that i need to start thinking bigger than just oh i just want to be a director i just want to be able to make the movies i want to make like right. we're not here to make one two three ten movies we're not here to get nominated on oscars and and then go away we need to flood the gates we need hundreds of we need to netflix this shit Netflix, you know, a billion dollars, $17 billion and make as much content as we can to round out and catch up for what's been happening. We need right. investors. We need money as crass as, as it is. We need to make theater. We need to make music. We need to make movies because that's and, and in this new Asian American or Asian diaspora sort of identity, because we haven't ever had the opportunity to paint the portrait of who we are. And we're many, 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 many things. And so we need to do as much stuff as we can. So in my mind, I'm like, we're not thinking big enough. Uh, we need to have a $15 billion fund. Maybe we'll start at a billion dollar fund <laughs> and just give everyone the opportunity. Go make it, go do it, go run it. Because the world we're going into is a world of information google people aren't going to read it out of books or see it by yeah. their memory they're looking right. it up and if we're not there if we're not the authors of the things that they're looking up right then we are only the victim of someone else seeing us and that's just not right. okay right we're, we're actually fighting for the future of who we are well that's why i love hey. seeing you because you two represent a whole new wave of how people see stars and how people uh see us in both Hamilton, but in the world. Yeah. And it gives me so much joy to, to be talking with you guys. Awesome. Yeah, I, I feel like, you know, just traveling around the country on this tour, just feeling a, such a sense of honor and responsibility to be in the role that I'm in yeah. to create visibility and, and, and show that all these Asian Americans in middle America that feel underrepresented can see themselves and have ownership of the experience through us, you know, and, and it's just, it's an incredible experience. That and by, show, by showing, showing that you are possible, mm -hmm. by showing that you, your story exists, now they're getting ready to, to live yeah. your story too. And they can take yeah. it. It's like, yeah, exactly. Um, Taiko, is there anything else that you'd like to ask? I mean, I could go on forever, but um, I, I Taiko, we got to work with each other. I can't believe we have I know, I know. It's gonna, it'll happen one day. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> for sure no doubt before we leave uh is there anything that you'd like to tell the next you know aapi generation of artists yeah i would say anyone who's watching this everyone has different roles in this march um you don't have to be the activist that yells and screams you don't have to be the twitter person you don't have to be the instagram person you have something to give you have some gift that you're doing and i think right now more than ever ignore all the other stuff you know what you need to make you know that outline you made you know you need to write that script you need to write that song go do it right now this is the calling you you've asked to be shown the way and i'm looking at you right now you've you've ended up on this conversation and you're looking at all three of us and we're saying go be laser focused be as disciplined as you can to get it done because this is the time we need you you don't have to yell and scream don't worry do the thing that you are here to give right now this is the moment awesome Awesome. Words of wisdom by 
the prolific John and Chu. Thank you so much for your time, man. Thank you so much for your time and energy and uh, best of luck and safety for you and your family, man. You too. Thanks guys. Thanks All right. So take much. it easy. Take care.